Hello everyone, I hope you've had a good week. Our lesson today is our first lesson in Colossians, and it begins with the first, uh, first chapter, the ninth verse, and the title of the lesson is The Gospel's Power. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we just thank you for this time to come together and study your word, and Lord, we just ask that you be with us and forgive us, and Lord, help us and lead us and guide us in our lives. Lord, we pray for those that are troubled today. Lord, we pray for those that are, are just, Lord, they don't know where to turn and they don't know what to do. And Lord, we just pray that you will be close to them, real to them, make a difference in their lives, Lord. Help them to open their hearts and minds, Lord, so they can hear from you. And Lord, I just ask you to be with our church, be with the leaders of our church, be especially with our pastor and his family. Lord, we just ask that you be with those that are lost and, lo and Lord, those in our community that are sick. And, and, Lord, we just ask for your healing power. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy and your blessings. We thank you most of all for Jesus. And, Lord, it's in his name we pray. Amen. Um, Let's just begin by reading uh, the first, verses 9 and 10. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord, unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Um, Ephorus was the believer that we talked about last Sunday who traveled back and forth between Philippi and Rome. And he also, along with gifts or support of money or whatever he uh, brought to Paul, he brought news of the different churches and the things that were going on in the churches as well. And in today's lesson, we're studying uh, about the church of, uh, of Colossians. And, uh, and uh, Paul was concerned and he prayed for this church. And uh, his burden for this church was that they would be filled with the knowledge of God's will. How does any of us know what God's will is? Um, there are some things we know for sure. You know, God's will is for us not to do wrong. Uh, follow the Ten Commandments. You know, don't covet, don't kill, don't uh, um, steal. Uh, honor your parents. Uh, love the Lord first and foremost. And love your neighbor. And uh, those are just a few. But we know for sure that he wants us to do those things. But how do we know what his will is for our lives? Um, I think how we know God's will is through his um, studying his word, uh, listening to sermons, uh, listening to music, um, reading spiritually related uh, books that help us to uh, kind of get a word from the Lord that kind of guides us in the right direction. And uh, I think it's through his wisdom and his understanding that we gain understanding. When we pray and we seek God's will, uh, we become focused on the Lord. And uh, as long as we're focused on the Lord, our focus is in the right place. Um, it says our hearts, our minds, and our decisions of will will we'll start lining up with the Lord. Um, Paul said if we can do this, if we can line up, if we can focus, then um, we can possess God's wisdom and understanding. It helps us to maintain a healthy life. Uh, we want to think when we are a Christian that we have, uh, that we strive to live a life that's pleasing to the Lord. We're not perfect. We're humans and we fail miserably sometimes. I do. And, uh, but there's a want to there as Christians. We want to live a life that's pleasing to the Lord. And we want to uh, do what we think he would have us to do. Paul says that pleasing the Lord 
you know, in basically living well with our fellow man, loving the Lord, being fruitful in all that we try to do, that that's pleasing to the Lord. When we live in harmony with other people, and uh, we strive to do that. I don't know about you, but I, I don't like conflict. I hate conflict. conflict. And uh, I, I want everybody to get along and want everybody to be happy. And, uh, of course, that's not life. You know, it's not, it's not life. We want it. We want our children to be happy. We want our grandchildren to be happy. We want our brothers and sisters to be happy. You know, and uh, we we pray for that. And uh, uh, But it's not always the way life is. And uh, so we have to deal with that. There is so much we don't know about life. So much we don't know about God. I think we just get a tip of the iceberg of what God is, how he thinks, how he does. And uh, I, I don't know if our minds can really take in how big God is and how powerful he is and uh, uh, how much we need to honor and respect him. Uh, it's an ongoing, pro pro ongoing work of progress, I believe, in our lives. Uh, when we're saved, we begin our spiritual walk, our spiritual journey in this life. And I think it's a growing process all the way, all the way. Uh, I'll be very honest, at, you know, and I've said this before, when I look back at myself when I was uh, first saved, you know, I wasn't much of a Christian. And uh, not that I'm so good now, because I'm not, but I do feel like I've grown uh, from that time till now. And, okay, let's look at verses 11 through 14. Find my glasses. Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Paul continues his prayer for uh, this church, and uh, he is expressing uh, the desire that the church of Colossians will be strengthened with their faith and strengthen with all might uh, through the Lord. Uh, when you really think about it in this life, our biggest enemies in this world are the world, um, the flesh, and the devil. Those are the three big things that we, we combat. And uh, the Colossians church face the same challenges that we do. We are not able to fight all these things that come our way on our own uh, and in our own strength. Uh, we need the Lord, and it is God who fights for us. Uh, it is his strength uh, that he gives to us that wins the victories in life. God's power is above our comprehension, and uh, but his power is also not measured by our need. It is measured by his himself and his uh, will to supply it. Um, God's glorious power is given according to, like I said, supply and his will. Um, there may be something that we pray that we, you know, maybe something's come into our life and, and we pray and say, Lord, remove it from me, remove it from me. And uh, he doesn't. And we, we wonder sometimes about that. But Paul, you know, in one of his scriptures talked about having a thorn in the flesh. And uh, I think sometimes that it's a learning experience for us. I think it's a faith experience, deepening our faith when we walk through valleys. Uh, we don't like to go through valleys. We don't want to go there. And uh, we don't want to be there. But sometimes it does strengthen our faith and, and maybe... Uh, draws us closer to the Lord through it. We depend on him totally when we have no choice. Isn't that sad? We depend on him totally when we have no choice. And uh, as Christians, he should be our first resort. 
And uh, so many times we try to fix everything ourselves. And uh, that's not God's way. God wants us to submit to Him uh, immediately and uh, with as much faith as we possibly can. Paul's desire was that a result of faithfulness on the part of the Galatian church uh, would be a blessing to them. And uh, they would learn uh, patience and long-suffering. Uh, life is a challenge. We know that. And uh, we are not a society uh, that wants to wait. We want it, you know, five minutes or less. And uh, and that that is, in a Christian's life, you know, that's not the way things work. Uh, you see people pray for people for years and years and years before they're saved. And uh, you have to be patient and long-suffering through that. Uh, instant everything, you know, is what we're wanting. And that's not how uh, life truly is. You know, sometimes it takes years and years uh, for us to see a change or a difference or something happen in our lives that we've prayed for for many years. Uh, endurance, I think, is the capacity to endure, uh, to see something through to the end, and uh, to complete it without um, without falling by the wayside, you know, staying focused and ending up in uh, that place where God wants us to be. Patience is a... a um, an evenness of, temp of temperament, I believe. Uh, waiting with steady resolve, uh, without irritation, anger, or frustration. Uh, patience is something I think we all long for, but I think the way we learn patience many times is going through trials and tribulations. And I've heard people, you know, things are go wrong in their lives, and they said, I'm gonna quit paying for, praying for patience because the Lord's, you know, teaching me pay to be patient by bringing things into my life. But um, I, I do think patience is something we strive for, something that we long for, but I do think it's in a challenge. It's a challenge to obtain it because uh, through, through trials and tribulations, most of the time is how we do obtain it. Uh, and like I said, I've heard people say, don't pray for patience uh, because uh, I can't handle all the things that God sent in my way. Um, what teaches us patience, like I said, um, I think it is true that it's trials and tribulations, but I think also it's really the Holy Spirit sometimes working in our lives uh, to teach us to respond to these challenges with faith and trust and obedience in the Heavenly Father. When God's power um, in our times of need help us, and restore us, then that brings joy. You know, we are we are joyful when uh, when God, you know, lifts a burden or answers a prayer. We're very joyful. And Paul wanted the Church of Colossians to experience the joy and the thanksgiving that comes through a, a good relationship with the Father. When we think about daily challenges, uh, they can become a big burden. But we have to look at the big picture. Um, God did more and does more, you know, than uh, help us in our daily lives. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. He has delivered us from evil. Um, Christians have been set free. Uh, we are no longer in the dark domain of, uh, of the devil. Uh, we have been forgiven and we do not have, a, you know, we are not in in the, the group that is not yet forgiven, has not yet asked Jesus Christ to be their Savior. We are in the, in the saved group who have accepted Christ, and we are, we are following him. Um, you know, Satan is called the Prince of Darkness for a reason, and I believe that sin is full of darkness, and that... Um, it's just a black, dark place to be. And and we've all had times in our life, I, I believe, when we've been in dark places. And uh, just by the hand of God and the, the forgiveness of God and the love of God, uh, do we get through those times and, uh, and, and, and really learn, you know, 
what it is to be there and, and how we don't want that for our life. We make choices. Uh, our, I do think, I know there's some things we can't control, but I do think we can choose uh, to follow Christ or choose to follow the devil. We, we have that choice. We have that freedom of choice. And uh, we um, have redemption through Jesus Christ, our Savior. It's available to us. And uh, what a wonderful gift that is. Let's look on at 15 through 20. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him. I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Paul wants us to see that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God the Father. Uh, you know, when we we think about the, the form that Jesus took here on earth, he took a human form, a, a form of a man, uh, we really don't know what he looked like. We have uh, ideas what he might have looked like, uh, and if it, you know, he was from Jew, he was a Jew, he was from uh, Israel. So uh, we we know that nationality, you know, and uh, we know that many times they're dark haired and dark eyed, and and uh, so we we get that we get that uh, image of him in our heads. But God the Father is a spirit. And so we can't, we can't really be in his image until I think we're, we're, we die and go to heaven. And then I think we become, uh, uh, we have a heavenly body, whatever that might be. But Christ, when it says Christ is the image of the Father, um, like I said, we know God is not a physical being, but God made Jesus come to earth for us, uh, for human beings to learn and to uh, get a better understanding of who God is because Jesus is God in, uh, incarnate. And uh, he, he showed us the personality of God, the character of God, the love of God through his walk here on earth. And uh, I think Paul refers to Jesus as the firstborn of creation and his dominion over all things as a way uh, that he was saying to them, you know, he was in heaven, he came to earth, he returned to heaven, but he created all things and all things are in his, under his power. So Paul reinforces, you know, that Jesus is the head of the body of the church. Uh, the church here means all saved people all over the world, uh, those in the past, those in the present, and those who will be saved in the future. Um, all those who've been forgiven are the church. Christ is supreme in both human uh, form and heavenly form. He is supreme in heaven and in earth. Uh, all things are under his power. Like I said, he is exalted above all others and above all things. Let's look at verses 21 through 23. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unprovable in his sight. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister.
When Christ died on the cross, his sacrifice was enough to save, save us all. Uh, every wicked, sinful person that's ever lived, uh, that will live. His sacrifice was enough. Uh, no other sacrifice needs to happen. All we have to do is trust in him. And he's the only, the only way. You know, he's the only way to get to heaven is through faith in him. Um, sinners are alienated from God. We are alienated from God because of our sin. God is a holy God, and he uh, can't look upon sin. He hates sin. And uh, he, uh, it's not that he can't look upon it, but he, he, he hates it, and he, he doesn't have any part of it because he is holy. Uh, he cannot accept it or tolerate it. The Bible tells us we are sinful by nature and that out of our hearts comes evil thoughts, murder, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemy. Blasphemies. Uh, all of these things defile us. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 4, verses 23 20 through 27, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Keep your mouth free of perversity. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the paths for your feet. And be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or the left. Keep your foot from evil. Paul said, if we continue in the faith grounded and settled, a faith that saves is a faith that perseveres. When Christ died on the cross, he paved the way for sinners to become reconciled to God the Father to be holy, acceptable, and blameless before God. He must see the blood of Jesus upon us. And uh, so Jesus looks. Uh, Jesus, God looks at us uh, when we're saved through, I want to say through the eyes of love, through the eyes of Jesus, because he sees the blood of Jesus upon us. And that makes us holy and acceptable to the Father. Uh, our, our, the love, the forgiveness, the acceptance that God gives us because of our faith is, is our hope. It's, what, it's, it's our hope for the future. It's our hope for eternity. Uh, you know, his death, like I said, gave us hope. Hope of eternal life through our faith in him. Paul was a minister of the gospel. He was committed to sharing the gospel and living a life. Uh, serving the Lord. His simple message was trust Jesus, nothing else. Trust Jesus. You didn't have to obey all the rules and the laws and, and uh, you know, do all the things that a lot of the, the religious people thought you had to do. He, he said, trust Jesus. And uh, today, I guess that's the message uh, that I got out of this lesson is through life, trust Jesus persevere, keep putting one foot in front of the other, and hold on to your faith, and, you know, as you walk through this life until you get to the end of it, uh, whenever that might be, you know, hold on to Jesus' hand. Trust him uh, for your future. I hope you've enjoyed the lesson. I hope you're doing well and being well, and until next time, much love.